Now I've got to ask you, isn't that a great logo? One of the greatest of all time, right? It perfectly embodies the concept of a packet network as a cloud, doesn't it? Every logo I've worked under holds a special place in my heart, but none like this one. The original cloud. Ah oh, yes, the original cloud. That sounds almost trite. But I remember when I would go on sales support calls and customers would ask why we used a cloud metaphor. It wasn't intuitive then. We had to explain how a cloud could represent a packet network. As far as I can find, TimeNet created that association and placed it in the minds of our customers. It seems to have lasted. Many of you remember TimeNet. Most of you know of TimeNet. Some of you worked for TimeNet. Others may have simply used TimeNet. Perhaps some have never heard of TimeNet before now and are here to find out what it had to do with the Internet. It's a fascinating story, a forgotten story. TimeNet is largely forgotten today and does not get the credit it truly deserves. The story of TimeNet is one I've worked to document and one I hope to tell. Before we can properly tell the story of TimeShare and TimeNet, we have to back up and set the stage to explain the state of computers in that era and why what they did was so important. Things were so very different then. We have all heard that the Internet came out of ARPANET, but why and how ARPANET was created, how the Internet evolved, and how all that related to TimeShare and TimeNet is almost forgotten. So let's wind up the Wayback Machine and set the stage first with a little history. In the 1950s and early 1960s, the idea of networking computers and remote users was pure science fiction. If you were distant from the computer, you called it on the phone. You called it up long distance, just like you would your Aunt Maisie. When you called a remote computer, you used a modem to talk to the computer over the long distance voice telephone network. And before deregulation, long distance calling was expensive. Packet switching changed that. Packet switching brought distant computers close, within easy reach. Had the voice network been more accessible and more reliable, packet switching might not have been given the priorities it was when it was. But how did we get from calling distant computers using the long distance telephone to using packet networks? In a very real sense, packet switching was born out of fear. Fears of Cold War aggression by the Russians, and with the Korean War starting around the same time, there was a lot to be fearful for. Slide 2. A new technological era of computers and networking began not with, but because of a bang. An atomic bang. It came in August of 1949, when the Soviet Union exploded their RDS-1 nuclear weapon. This caught the entire world off guard but more importantly, it shocked and surprised the U.S. defense community. They had thought the Soviets were decades away from building a bomb. An ancient adage goes, when in danger, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. This seems like a good description of the reaction. The defense community formed a committee. Committees are tailor-made for running in circles. The man charged with the screaming and shouting was named George Valley, and the committee he chaired became known as the Valley Committee. Research was launched to drive technological innovation in the fields of radar, computers and control systems, and advanced networking. That the answer to Soviet nukes lay in the development of even more science fictional technology seemed obvious to the Valley Committee. Boxcars of cash dispersed by the government could solve anything. Slide 3. The Valley Committee recommended a massive overlapping radar curtain known as the Distant Early Warning or Dew Line. Starting in 1954, many thousands of skilled workers were recruited, transported to the polar regions, housed, fed, and supplied with tools and materials to build massive facilities in some of the most hostile and isolated environments on planet Earth. Construction began on advanced radar facilities, many on offshore platforms called Texas Towers. A large number of land-based stations were built in the far northern Arctic region of Canada, with stations in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska in order to spot Soviet bombers approaching from over the North Pole. Only a bit over three years later, by the end of 1957, 182 stations were fully operational, eight years after RDS-1. Years ago, I met a retired engineer who had worked at one of the Alaska stations. He told stories, man did he tell stories, fantastic stories of the massive construction project and the difficulties of building and maintaining facilities and equipment in the frigid Arctic environment. The tale I remember most is how the workers would seek shelter from the cold by hanging out in front of the radar antenna. It was only after they began dying from the microwave exposure that officials took notice and fenced off the area. Slide 4. The Whirlwind 
The Valley Committee tapped MIT for their computer expertise, and MIT recommended their biggest and most powerful research computer to date as the perfect machine to link all the radar stations and other facilities. That computer was called the Whirlwind. It was necessary, however, to transform Whirlwind from a one-off research project to a mass-produced computer. This was a bigger challenge than you might imagine. Until then, there were no mass-produced computers. Every computer of that time was a one-off research project, unique and hand-built for a specific job. Transforming the Whirlwind into a production machine that could be consistently replicated was critical. The Valley Committee plan called for 64 such machines. No one had built 64 instances of any single computer before. IBM was contracted as the hardware manufacturer. The software development was to be done by the MIT team and the SAGE engineers. Like almost every computer project in the history of time, the scope and cost of the software development was massively underestimated. Slide 5. Whirlwind became SAGE, semi-automatic ground environment. SAGE was the system, including the computer and its extended network of radar systems and other devices. The technical designation of the computer itself was the AN slash FSQ7, or just Q7 for short. It was the largest computer ever built, by far. The Q7 computer itself occupied 22,000 square feet and weighed 250 tons. Each Q7 used 60,000 vacuum tubes. Slide 6. Core memory and vacuum tubes. Big computers, especially those using vacuum tubes, were unreliable. Getting 10 to 20 hours of operation between failures was considered good reliability. The electrostatic memory of the whirlwind was inadequate. Realizing they needed something better, the researchers explored using core memory. They created the first working core memory system in the summer of 1953. The Q7 was then fitted with a core memory array driven by vacuum tubes. Developing the core memory for the Q7 required two years of development to create a core plane holding 1,024 bits of data. These core planes could then be stacked to obtain any size memory required. Each Q7 memory module, as shown here, held 16 such planes for 16,384 bits. That's 1,024 16-bit words. Slide 7. For reliability, the Q7 was deployed with two computers per site in the hopes that when one went down, the standby could assume control and keep operations running while repairs were made. The plans called for installing 32 sites, each site holding two computers for a total of 64 computers. Slide 8. Sage terminal consoles were noted for their pioneering raster graphics and they used a light pen to select on-screen objects, anticipating today's graphical interfaces significantly. Slide 9. They also sported an iPhone charging port and spare change holder as standard equipment. Slide 10. Each installation had 100 such consoles, plus printers and a big screen projection display. The terminals were dispersed throughout the huge facility. Slide 11. Beginning in 1955, the SAGE installations started coming online. It was far advanced over the original Whirlwind system. Here we see the large screen of the operations center. The Q7 was considerably more polished and photogenic than Whirlwind, and as a result, Hollywood used parts of the Q7 in many productions. Slide 12. This view of the SAGE projection display has appeared a few times in movies, notably in Dr. Strangelove. Other components have taken the stage in many movies and TV shows. My personal favorite is the Q7 used in Irwin Allen's The Time Tunnel, slide 13, starring Lee Merriweather. Sage components also appeared in Battlestar Galactica and many other productions, slide 14. The Time Tunnel's 1966 prop computer looked so realistic because it was a real array of modules from a recently decommissioned Q7 computer, slide 15. An enormous network of interconnected resources allowed SAGE to receive and evaluate data from many sources. Modems connected the Q7 to remote radar sites, air bases, missile sites, weather installations, ships, airborne radar, and even fighter jets in flight. SAGE was the first big computer network, but it was not a packet switching network. It relied on point-to-point -point modem connections with little redundancy. It worked, but it was vulnerable to disruptive failures that could break connections. It used voice telephone circuits with modems, and there was much faxing of paper documents to and from remote locations. Slide 16. The first modems for computer networking were built for SAGE. 
Sage was housed in enormous bomb-proof windowless four-story blockhouses of hardened cement and steel construction. Slide 17. Each building held nearly four acres of floor space. Each blockhouse was next to a generator and air conditioning plant that could power and cool a small city in an Arizona summer. You see that in the image here. The first Sage installation came online in 1955. The software development was a never-ending resource sink, and the Q7 was never able to deliver the expected performance. Critics claim the whole project was a massive fraud on the American taxpayers, trading on fears of Soviet aggression to line the pockets of the big defense companies at taxpayer expense. Whether that's a fair assessment is debatable, but we can all agree that it cost a lot of money and never delivered the expected benefits. 32 installations were planned with 64 computers. 23 were actually built before the enormous cost overruns and lackluster computer performance doomed the whole project. As Sage construction was rapidly pro progressing, slide 18, on October 4, 1957, the second technological salvo from Russia, Sputnik, once again sent the U.S. defense community running in circles. The Pentagon rolled out a few more boxcars of money. ARPA, long worried about the vulnerability of the networking, threw money at RAND and MIT and other academic institutions to fund research. Berkeley got Project Genie, which we'll hear more about in a moment. Dartmouth received funding for their computer time-sharing research, and many more projects were funded at various places. RAND and MIT studied networking, and throughout the 1960s, various papers appeared promoting a new idea called packet switching. We take it for granted today, but it was a cutting-edge idea then. Slide 19. Meanwhile, SAGE research was filtering down to the civilian world. One such civilian project was launched when Blair Smith of IBM happened to sit next to Charles R. Smith of American Airlines on a 1953 flight, and the two unrelated men noted their shared surname and began chatting. IBM was heavily involved in SAGE and was looking for other areas to use advanced computer technology. Thirty days after the two men's chance conversation, IBM sent a research proposal to American Airlines. The first Sabre system came online in 1960. Sabre would become an important user of networking and would help drive an important airline reservation business line for timeshare. Slide 20. The second civilian spinoff, and one more directly interesting to us, was a massive undertaking by Bank of America and SRI to leverage the advanced computer technology to automate the process of clearing checks. The research ran until 1955 at which point Bank of America froze the design. The prototype used 8,000 vacuum tubes and weighed 25 tons. It consumed over 80,000 watts of electricity. The project was offered for bidding, and General Electric, who was not then in the computer business, won the bid and launched a new business line, computers. GE's first computer was the GE100, created for the project named Electronic Recording Machine, Accounting, a.k.a. IRMA. GE proposed changing the design from tubes to transistors and, like Sabre, used cutting-edge magnetic core memory and other hardware advancements that had been developed for SAGE. GE's proposal won the business, and IRMA came online July 1, 1959. The IRMA project would become an important inflection point in the evolution of timeshare. IRMA is where four men who would go on to play important roles in Timeshare and TimeNet would meet. Thomas O'Rourke and Dave Schmidt both worked for GE. They formed a team, along with two engineers, to build a special project for Lockheed. GE had sold Lockheed a pair of GE 400 series computers to replace their IBM 1401s. The GE systems lacked an advanced operating system. Lockheed insisted they provide one. GE's operating system developers refused and declared that what Lockheed wanted was impossible. Dave and Tom recruited future timeshare employees numbers 3 and 4, Vern Van Vleer and Arden Scott, who were then a pair of GE engineers stationed in Sunnyvale, into a skunkwork-style project to create what Lockheed wanted. The group spent four months of strenuous hair-pulling effort, but they succeeded, surprising the naysayers. However, these pressure of the project and the exertion involved left Dave and Tom feeling burned out. At that point, Dave resolved that he was going to go into business for himself. Slide 21. General Electric, having bootstrapped themselves into the computer business in 1955 with Irma, provided the computer systems used by Dartmouth. 
In 1962, Dartmouth submitted a grant application to develop a new timesharing system, and it was funded in 1964. Fifty-four years ago, on May 1, 1964, the experimental DTSS timesharing system came online using GE 200 series computers. Immediately, GE began demonstrating the early Dartmouth timesharing system. Tom saw the demo and was impressed. It was at this point that Dave created the timeshare logo and he and Vern built a trade show booth in Dave's garage. Dave then invited Tom to join him and he and Tom began demonstrating the Dartmouth system at shows around the Bay Area, beginning with a show at the Cow Palace, using a teletype machine and a modem dialing long distance. Their demonstrations were powerful. Remember, this was the tail end of the era of punch card decks. At the time, every engineer had a Fortran program that did whatever it was their specialty required. Running it meant submitting a card deck and waiting. Typically, it was a 24-hour turnaround. In Dave and Tom's demo, an engineer could sit at a terminal and enter a program interactively, line by line. And then the response came back. Instantly, while they stood there, it blew their minds. It was a total paradigm shift. Those early shows were highly successful and convinced that they had a winning idea. In May of 1965, the pair left GE to pursue the dream and formed Timeshare Associates. Slide 22, Timeshare Associates. Timeshare Associates saw a clear market, offering timesharing services to the science and engineering community around the Bay Area. But they had no money and no computer. Despite having a wife and kids to feed, Tom went all in to launch the company. He liquidated his GE pension. In fact, he and Dave both invested their entire assets. They created a detailed, comprehensive, 110-page business plan and began exploring the San Francisco Financial District in search of funding. They were seeking $250,000. Just $250,000. But that was over 50 years of inflation ago. Scratch out that number and insert $2 million for a better perspective. They found a willing investor in Bank of America under the auspices of the U.S. Small Business Administration. The pair received a $250,000 investment from B of A's Small Business Enterprises Company, SBEC, and it was approved July 1965. Slide 23. With funding in hand, the partners moved forward with plans to buy a computer and start offering services. They had planned to use a GE Model 225 and replicate the Dartmouth timesharing environment. In August, GE dealt them a near-death blow, rejecting the order. GE had simultaneously announced plans to go into the timesharing business themselves using that same system. When Timeshare announced their plans in order to GE Computer, GE refused the order, saying they did not want to enable competition. Remember, at the time, all computing was local. If someone connected remotely to a computer, it was via a long-distance voice telephone call using modems. In 1966, packet networks didn't exist. Networking meant voice. Tom and Dave planned to offer local computing service whereby local engineers could use the system without having to make a long-distance telephone call. But there was an unexpected development. GE, a very large company, had built and operated a private voice telephone network which served their internal business needs. They planned to use that voice network to offer computer services over a large area. This private voice telephone network enabled GE to compete with Timeshare even though the GE computer was not local. Unable to buy a computer, Timeshare turned to research being done at UC Berkeley under the ARPA-funded Project Genie. Remember, I said we'd get to that. Berkeley was using a Scientific Data Systems SDS 930 computer, which lacked memory management and other features necessary for timesharing. Tom negotiated with SDS to create what became the SDS 940, a 930 with memory management, more memory, and importantly, disk drives. The 930 only had tape and punch cards. SDS objected to Dave and Tom's plans and did not want to create the special purpose computer that they wanted. The president of SDS thought the time sharing was a fad that would soon go away. He thought the whole thing was silly. The deal they eventually reached with SDS required them not only to buy a computer themselves, but to sell four more to other companies, including one that went to SRI, which would later become the first computer connected to the ARPANET. With a computer in development, they formally incorporated the company as Timeshare Incorporated and began plans to launch their business. The press took notice in the form of a small blurb in Datamation magazine. 
Meanwhile, at Lawrence Livermore Labs, Norm Hardy had been working to create a timesharing for the IBM 7030 stretch system that Lawrence was using. His wife, Ann, was a systems programmer who had developed the lab's Fortran compiler and was working with Livermore scientists to refine their scientific research programming. Ann Hardy was very much aware of and using the Livermore timesharing system. Spotting the Datamation article, she called up Dave and asked about getting a terminal for her personal use at home, which was an unheard of idea at the time. Ann says she was surprised at how open and honest Dave was about the true state of the company and the development of their computer. Ann told him that he needed to hire her to create their operating system. So, he did. She became employee number five, joining Timeshare in February of 1966. They had no computer and would not have one until May, but they had printed listings of the prototype system Berkeley had created and set to work identifying the additional work that would be needed. Ann Hardy was the systems programmer who tamed Berkeley's experimental time-sharing system and made it a practical, enterprise-worthy system. Click to next bullet. In July 1966, early customers were given free trials based on Tom's deal in which SDS had given Timeshare six months free use of the computer. The 1966 SDS 940 was the computer that built Timeshare. It had less processing power than today's average digital watch, although it probably was more powerful than the Q7. Slide 24, paying customers. The free trial ended, and beginning with November 1966, the first bills went out. On the strength of those early bills, Tom was able to obtain additional funding. But GE was emerging as a fierce competitor. With their private voice network allowing them to reach customers over a wide area, and with the more mature and more robust operating system from Dartmouth, Timeshare found themselves challenged to compete, forced to lower their price. Timeshare opened an LA branch to serve that area without the cost of long distance calling. Competing with GE was becoming a serious challenge. Meanwhile, Paul Buran of Rand Corporation had published the seminal research on packet switching between 1960 and 1962. ARPA funded work on the idea throughout the early 1960s, and Leroy Times had been following that research with great interest. He saw packet switching as the key to making time sharing accessible. He felt that the regional model of locating data centers near the communities where computers were needed was flawed. Timeshare had launched with that business model and their experience was proving Leroy correct in that it was inadequate in the face of GE's wide area network. Even though a voice network, the power of networking was becoming obvious. Leroy Times had been chafing to join Timeshare since the very beginning. He was also fascinated by the networking research and very much wanted to build a packet network. And he saw Timeshare's challenges with GE as his opportunity to do so. In early 1968, he finally convinced Dave and Tom and joined Timeshare and began building his network. I do need to clarify one common misunderstanding. Neither the network nor the company name had any connection to Leroy's surname. Dave coined the name Timeshare while still at GE long before he ever heard of Leroy Times, who was then at Livermore. And the network was named after Timeshare, not named for Leroy. In fact, several at the time objected to naming it Time Anything and were seeking a different name, but Time Network had just happened to be the best anyone could come up with. Leroy's surname was an unrelated, if stunning coincidence. Slide 25, TimeNet created. Leroy rolls out the pilot network in late 1968, one full year ahead of ARPANET. In early 1969, they began carrying timeshare customers on the network, that in itself establishing an important milestone, providing remote computing service for paying customers using a packet switch network. From 1969 until the end of 1971, the network was refined and improved and grown to better serve timeshare's customers. During this time frame, Timeshare pioneered many new services that today we would categorize as Software as a Service, or SaaS. This was a radical new idea. You have to understand that in the punch card era, there was no commercially available software. Whether you were an engineer and needed a program to calculate a scientific function, or you were a businessman who needed a program to print a payroll, you wrote your software or you paid someone to do it for you. Software was written one line at a time and encoded on punch cards. The idea of having a spreadsheet or a payroll program simply available online for use was new and radical. Timeshare created numerous programs such as their 
well-received Super Fortran in 1969, Easy Plot, a drafting program in 1970, Retrieve, a true database program in 1971, and TimeTab, one of the most innovative of all, a spreadsheet program in 1971. Yes, you heard me right. A spreadsheet program in 1971 using teletype dumb terminals at 10 characters per second. Unbelievable. They created these programs and many more. They offered these to timesharing customers via TimeNet. These were the first cloud services that anyone could use online via a packet switch network. In February 1972, with the FCC's blessing, TimeNet began carrying traffic for the National Library of Medicine. The library held a database of poison anecdotes which they wanted to make available online. This is a milestone for two reasons. One, because their computer was the first non-timeshare computer to be connected to TimeNet, and two, because it also marked the point at which TimeNet became a value-added network. The NLM computer was an IBM, and IBM spoke EBCDIC, therefore could only talk to IBM terminals. This new value-added feature was that, within the network, translation from EBCDIC to ASCII was performed, and remote users on dumb ASCII teletype terminals could access a non-ASCII host computer, with the network itself taking care of all of the translation issues. Translating between incompatible protocols became a very important hallmark of TimeNet's value-added feature set. In December 1976, TimeNet would seek and be granted common carrier status, but had already paved the way to do so by seeking the FCC's blessing to offer public services for the NLM in 1972. Slide 26. By 1972, the network had more than 50 nodes and covered a vast geographical area. The supervisor-driven, centrally directed routing was mature and supporting most of the features that came to make TimeNet superior in the emerging value-added intelligent network space, as defined by the optimized routing, the intelligent protocol conversions, and network-hosted applications. These features made TimeNet much more than a simple pipe carrying bytes between two points. TimeNet's use of a central supervisor to manage the network routing became a favorite target for TimeNet's critics. They scorned the central process as a performance bottleneck and a barrier to scaling to a large network. Critics proclaimed a decentralized approach as the only viable solution, but TimeNet's approach conferred immense value by optimizing usage of expensive lines and by congestion avoidance. TCP IP architects sought to avoid a centralized control point, thus no central point of failure or performance bottleneck. That seemed like a convincing argument until the need for translating domain names to IP addresses emerged. The DNS server's similarity to the TimeNet supervisor was lost on the critics. The supervisor also performed functions beyond routing. It authenticated the user's network level credentials and collected accounting data, a critical service in a commercial network. The centralized routing possessed singular advantage over X25 static routing or the decentralized routing of TCP IP in that the supervisor maintained a complete real-time network-wide map. Thus, when it made a routing decision, it returned the optimal available route. The supervisor was able to assess the capacity of available pathways and minimize congestion. Long-haul lines were expensive, and the supervisor was finely tuned to make the most of available capacity and minimize congestion. Further, the network distinguished between low-speed interactive traffic and high-speed transfers, and chose the optimal path based on speed. Thus, a teletype user pecking away at 10 characters per second might be routed very differently than a high-speed print task headed for a 600 line per minute printer. Slide 27. By the mid-1970s, the Varian Mini Computer based network nodes were running out of capacity. TimeNet needed a new, much more powerful platform. The engineers were evaluating the available mini computers for an upgrade path. Leroy had previously picked the Interdata 732 as the platform of choice for the supervisor, replacing the one that had run on the SDS 940. He chose it based on the expectation that a promised 832 was in the pipeline and would offer a faster upgrade path. The 832, however, proved a disappointment and was never used, and the 732 had proved itself just simply not powerful enough. Unable to find a suitable machine, Leroy decided to build his own. In doing so, he created the TimeNet engine. The engine ran the same software as the Interdata, only much faster, and the boards were designed in-house by Leroy. 
The engine offered much faster processing and network-specific enhancements, including more registers for better multitasking and specialized microcode for networking functions. More registers and custom microcode for networking made the engine much faster than the interdata in network-specific functions. The engine was superficially similar to the interdata, but was in no way a copy or rebadged interdata. Prototypes of the engine were completed and operating on the network at the end of 1977. The advanced features of the engine included all the memory management and multitasking features needed for a true time-sharing operating system. The next logical step, then, was to migrate from the standalone node environment to a true operating system. Thus was born the idea of a network operating system, or NOS. A NOS was much like a traditional time-sharing operating system, except geared toward the real-time nature of networking. Art Case was the man who conceived the idea of a NOS for the engine. Art was the idea man, but not the builder. That role fell to the late Dr. John Koff, who worked for Art at the time. John charged into building the NOS, and single-handedly had the initial system up and running in record time. He named his creation the Internally Switched Interface Software, or ISIS, influenced, no doubt, by his fascination with Egyptian mythology. ISIS and the TimeNet engine proved to be a powerful combination allowing multiple interfaces and even full applications to reside in what John named slots in the engine. You could create a network of TimeNet nodes all running within the same ISIS engine. Click to next bullet. In 1979, TimeNet announced this architecture, which they named the Advanced Communications Technology, or ACT, at the NCC show in May of that year. Click to next no one had anything like this, and ACT drove TimeNet to new heights of value-added networking capability. Slide 28, ARPANET. ARPA's spending on network research accelerated after Sputnik, and throughout the early to mid-1960s, ideas gelled about how to build a packet network. In mid-1968, ARPA asked 140 companies to bid on the project. Most thought it was too radical, but 12 took it seriously and responded. On April 7, 1969, ARPA awarded a $1 million contract to a military contractor known as BBNN for a four-node experiment, a proof of concept. Compare this contract to the mere $250,000 Tom and Dave had secured to launch their entire company. Meanwhile, TimeNet was already operational, built at a fraction of the cost. Click to next. On November 21, 1969, the first ARPA-funded link came online. It connected the SDS-940 at SRI, the same one Tom had sold there three years earlier, to another SDS computer at UCLA. This was a full year after TimeNet's initial customer connections. Click to Next. The four-node pilot network became operational on December 7, 1969. Click to Next. In March of 1970, the BBNN headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts was linked into the network, making it bi-coastal. TimeNet was again well advanced ahead of ARPANET. Click to Next. Most estimates suggest the cost to taxpayers for building ARPANET exceeded $25 million, although the exact cost is unknown, and that figure excludes ongoing operational costs, much of which were borne by the universities and other institutions who connected to the network. We don't know what it cost, but it was a lot. Slide 29, Telenet. The commercial data network known as Telenet Communications Corporation, or just Telenet, was established by BNN with former ARPANET head Larry Roberts as president, along with Barry Wessler. They began offering commercial services to paying customers on August 16, 1975, more than three years after the NLM offered their poison control database to subscribers via TimeNet. Their publicity always promoted them as the first public commercial packet switch network, and even their Wikipedia page today continues the claim. Click to Next. Their inaugural service had a presence in seven U.S. cities, a fraction of TimeNet's footprint. Click to Next. CCITT X25 is an international standard protocol defined by the CCITT, which is now known as the ITU. Telenet used the CCITT protocols and loudly claimed to be the first CCITT network. Telenet garnered much press with their claims of international standard support. Even so, 
the X-25 connection between Canada's data pack and Telenet, who incidentally were TimeNet's two greatest critics, was provided by TimeNet. They were unable to connect directly to one another. Click to Next. The Telenet network used statically defined hop-by-hop -hop routing. By contrast, TimeNet had the supervisor and dynamic routing in 1971. Click to Next. Telenet is important, very important, to the history of TimeNet because they were a fierce competitor who pushed TimeNet to try harder and be better. Telenet was an X25 network and helped drive the international standards. TimeNet was not, however, an X25 network. Unlike Telenet, we did not use CCITT protocols. We did develop an X25 interface that ran as an ISIS slot, and it was purposely designed to be as flexible as possible. You have to understand, complex international standards like X.25 can be subject to interpretation. As a result, widely differing implementations may not be able to connect to one another reliably. Recognizing that interoperability was important, Carl Karnan, the programmer under the direction of Art Case, implemented TimeNet's X25 as a highly flexible parameter-driven protocol able to accommodate almost any possible variation within the divine standard. As a result, TimeNet became the interconnection between all of the X25 networks that could not talk directly to one another. TimeNet became the go-between, the Rosetta Stone, the translator, for all the different CCITT dialects. In 1976, Telenet filed a complaint with the FCC, ever the fierce competitor. They alleged that TimeNet was not legitimate and had no operating permission. It was a false complaint as Timeshare's Warren Prince, Bill Combs, and their attorney, Steve Bell, had conferred with the FCC in 1972 when they first began offering public service to the National Library of Medicine and they had in fact obtained FCC blessings, FCC permission, to offer public network services. Even so, that complaint galvanized Timeshare into fully committing to the network business. Up until that point, Timeshare had imbued the networking as an adjunct to the timesharing business and any public network service sold as just incidental business. Telenet's complaint goaded Timeshare into fully committing to the network as a fully funded operation and applying for common carrier status. In December of 1976, the FCC granted TimeNet common carrier status and TimeNet was then spun off as a separate company. By their complaint, Telenet had done TimeNet a huge favor. If not for the competitive pressure from Telenet, TimeNet may well not have become the technologically advanced worldwide network we remember today. Slide 30. Let's recap the origins of the three networks. TimeNet came online in December of 1968, funded wholly by Timeshare. It was built at minuscule cost, virtually funded from petty cash. Each piece built on a success basis, each step carefully justified by financials. Not only was it profitable, it was profitable virtually from day one and became highly profitable. And when, many years later, MCI tried to shut it down, they discovered that it remained a cash cow, with legacy customers demanding the value-added services that only TimeNet offered. It was too profitable to easily discard and took years to wind down. Click to Next. ARPANET came online in December 1969, funded by the taxpayers. Costs are largely unknown, but the initial contract for a $1 million four-node experimental network dwarfed to the funding available to TimeNet. The often cited build total is $25 million, and that ignores the operating costs that were buried in the financials of taxpayer-supported installations using the network. ARPANET was highly restricted with a burdensome acceptable uses policy, or AUP, that prohibited any use that could even remotely be seen as commercial. Since the network was paid for by the taxpayers, commercial use of any form was prohibited. Click to Next. Telenet came online in 1974, funded by BBNN and leveraging the taxpayer-funded research done for ARPANET. BBNN invested heavily in the network, but despite their deep pockets, it went bankrupt and was acquired by GTE. GTE then invested heavily, but was never able to make the network profitable. Finally, GTE sold it to Sprint, who migrated the customers to SprintLink, putting them on the commercial internet. Slide 31. Lifespan. ARPANET ended in 1990, spun off into CSNet, MilNet, and NSFNet, which continued operating taxpayer-funded networks. 
The interconnection of these entities fostered the term Internet to describe a network of interconnected networks. In 1990, the NSF created ANS, a partnership of Merit, IBM, and MCI to manage the newly envisioned commercial Internet. The ANS vision of a commercial Internet differed sharply from the vision shared by a number of upstart private IP network service providers. They didn't call them ISPs then. That term hadn't been invented but they were private IP network service providers. These people also wanted to offer commercial services using internet technologies. In 1991, these providers, led by Rick Adams of UUNet, formed the Commercial Internet Exchange, or KICS, to exchange traffic without restrictions. Technological problems prevented the KICS from scaling to the level they needed, and it would soon be replaced with a better solution. Click to next. Scott Yeager of MFS DataNet and Rick Adams of UUNet created May East in 1992, and May East drew all the commercial business away from the NSF and ANSNet. May East soon carried more than 90% of all the world's internet traffic. ANS sold their networking assets to AOL, and then AOL's remains were sold to Verizon. ANS subsequently closed. Slide 32. Telenet ended in 1992, absorbed into the commercial internet by Sprint. Their technology had been entirely based in the international protocol suite. Click to next. They were acquired first by GE in 1979, then by Sprint in 1991. The emerging commercial internet obliterated any remaining value for the ITU protocol infrastructure, and it is now a dead protocol these days. Sprint quickly migrated the remaining customers to their internet sh service and shut down Telenet. Click to next. Sprint is now a tier one internet provider with a 100 gigabit backbone. Slide 33, lifespan timeshare. Timeshare was incorporated at the beginning of 1966 and lasted 18 years until it was sold to McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas operated a timesharing business of their own, catering to aerospace and energy production. They were a huge customer of TimeNet and thought that adding Timeshare's services to their portfolio was a big win. They failed to recognize that the timesharing business was being decimated by the emergence of inexpensive microcomputers. They believed, perhaps rightfully, that the cheap little machines could never compete with a large mainframe for compute-intensive scientific applications. But they ignored the fact that much timesharing revenue came from much more mundane applications. Those less demanding jobs which microcomputers could perform, they were rapidly assuming, and the revenue loss was disastrous for the timesharing business. During its 18-year lifespan, Timeshare pioneered many innovations and led their industry. In 1966, they created the first commercial timesharing system that any company could buy, thanks to GE refusing to sell their system to competitors. In 1968, Timeshare com created the first commercial packet switch network for users accessing remote time-shared services. In 1972, they offered the very first public networking services. Along the way, they pioneered the service model that today we call software as a service with many advanced cloud-type applications. Timeshare grew from a self-funded startup launched with the liquidated pensions of the two founders to $297 million in revenue. And although that was not quite enough to propel them into the Fortune 500 ranks, they came very close. Click to next. In 1984, Timeshare sold itself to McDonnell Douglas just as the timesharing business model began to wither. By 1989, when McDonnell Douglas sold TimeNet to British Telecom, Timeshare's business model had ceased to have much relevance. Click to next. The character of network services themselves was rapidly changing, from interactive users on dumb terminals to computer to computer data transfers at high speeds. Click to next. The internet and the web was on the horizon, though relatively few then saw it coming. Click to next. A few years later, the internet would reinvent time sharing as the interactive web page, but low speed dumb terminals were cast onto the trash heap. Slide 24. TimeNet. TimeNet was the longest operating network from its inception in 1968 to its demise in 2004. It was built by a tiny team of timeshare engineers, Leroy Times, Art Case, and the late John Koff, among others. They had a minuscule budget and limited resources compared to ARPANET. 
Yet, Timenet dominated the field, survived the time-sharing era, and persisted through three acquisitions. Click to next. Timenet was finally doomed when networking shifted from interactive users on dumb terminals to land-to-land -land connections at high speeds. Timenet's value-added model of highly flexible protocol conversion, support for esoteric protocols, and network resident applications was no longer an asset once the world shifted from dozens of proprietary protocols to standardize on TCP IP. Click to next. This shift placed impossible demands on the sophisticated ACT architecture. The deep packet manipulation, so necessary for complex protocol conversions and translations, and the extreme optimization of bandwidth utilization and congestion avoidance that had made TimeNet so sophisticated and profitable in the timesharing era became an unworkable burden once all data was TCP IP protocol and a T1 line became considered low speed. Unable to adapt to the changing demands, TimeNet withered even as a shrinking customer base who still needed its capabilities and were willing to pay for them remained loyal. Click to next. A cash cow to the very end, TimeNet's value-added network was finally shuttered in 2004, representing the longest and most productive run of any network of its time. Slide 35. A tectonic shift in computers and networking. Timeshare had built their business model on the concept of computing resources being expensive, remote, and shared. They had built TimeNet on the concept of interactive users accessing remote resources using dumb terminals. In 1974, Altair fired the first shot in the coming war. Altair introduced the Altair 8800, almost as powerful as a 1958 IBM 1401 mainframe. It cost under $700, or roughly half what an ASR33 dumb terminal cost compared to the $125,000 and a 1401 cost. The lack of software and lack of a standardized hardware platform inhibited microcomputer acceptance. It was not until the 1981 introduction of the IBM PC that mainstream businesses began to treat microcomputers seriously. The death knell had sounded for the time-sharing business, and with inexpensive computers on every desktop, networking was poised to undergo tremendous changes. Networking was about to shift from low-speed interactive users banging away on dumb terminals to high-speed computer-to-computer data transfers, a mode that lay outside of TimeNet's sweet spot. The waning time-sharing business model prompted TimeShare to sell itself. McDonnell Douglas, with their large time-sharing operation, had not yet recognized the impact of microcomputers and wanted TimeShare for their time-sharing business, caring less about the network. In fact, they wanted to shut down the public network and retain for internal use only those parts of TimeNet they could use to serve their time-sharing business customers. Fortunately, TimeNet management dissuaded McDonnell Douglas from this course, and as a result, McDonnell Douglas continued supporting the network. But McDonnell Douglas was having money troubles and would soon begin selling off many of their assets, including, unfortunately, TimeNet. The emergence of TCP IP and Ethernet in the mid-1980s accelerated this change. TimeNet faced immense challenges as the TimeNet engine and ICE's network operating system were simply the wrong architecture to cope with the emerging high-speed demands. New technologies were appearing. The compute-intensive value-added protocols gave way to the fast switching and streamlined processing. Asynchronous transfer mode, aka ATM, and frame relay offered streamlined protocols that could be fast switched in dedicated silicon. TimeNet's immense protocol conversion library and flexible ISIS architecture held on to a loyal following for a time. TimeNet lasted until 2004 before the last supervisor was shut down. A few isolated TimeNet engines continued a while longer as island nodes supporting legacy X25 gateways between incompatible X25 services. But X25 itself like the TimeNet engine, is no more. In 1992, British Telecom sold TimeNet to MCI, and MCI didn't even want the TimeNet branding. They wanted to shut down TimeNet and migrate the customers to Frame Relay, but couldn't right away because the legacy customers were willing to pay for the protocol conversions and other services, making the withering value-added network a cash cow despite being considered obsolete. Slide 36, TimeNet 2.0. Several years before the last TimeNet engine was shut down, the formation began of another company that would soon become important 
in the creation of the commercial internet. On March 12, 1986, tiny startup Chicago Fiber Optics Corporation launched. Peter Kiewit's Sons, or PKS, contracted to install a series of fiber optic cables. PKS is a huge construction company. Undercapitalized, Chicago Fiber Optics floundered and collapsed owing PKS for their services. PKS assumed control and began operating the, the business. Deciding to expand the business model to other cities, they changed the name. Metropolitan Fiber Services was created in 1988 in Chicago and set about providing optical fiber-based telephone connections to businesses. Data networking was not on their minds. They were a telephone company, didn't understand data, and had no interest in data. But meanwhile, in Houston, another fiber optic company known as Network Communications Inc., or NCI, was getting underway. NCI was not a voice telephone company. It was a data-focused company seeking to use fiber to transport high-speed land services beyond the office walls. The founder of NCI was Scott Yeager, and when, in February of 1989, MFS decided to enter the Houston market, they purchased NCI for their fiber routes and city permits. Scott Yeager was a champion of data services and pushed MFS to continue offering the land extension service. MFS telecom engineers didn't like this and resisted. They didn't understand data and considered it unimportant. But Scott persisted, and in late 1991, MFS decided to launch a separate company to address the data business. MFS Datanet was the new company, and the existing voice business became MFS Telecom. The president of TimeNet, Al Finn, left BT along with many TimeNet employees, including yours truly, to found MFS Datanet in early 1992. Slide 37. Datanet provided the missing piece MFS needed to blend data transport into their service offerings. Soon, MFS Datanet was deploying a nationwide backbone built on long-haul DS3s and ATM, replicating the TimeNet business-to-business -business model. Click to Next. But they were not interested in supporting interactive users on dumb terminals, nor were they interested in protocol conversions. That ship had long sailed. LANs and TCP IP had won the networking world. Datanet's service was high-speed LAN interconnect using ATM and frame relay with an Ethernet handoff. Click to Next. The LAN interconnect service was ideal for connecting private IP network service providers and became the basis of May East and the commercial internet backbone. Click to Next. May East was hugely successful and MFS then acquired Rick Adams UUNet in 1996 for $2.2 billion, only to then be acquired themselves by WorldCom a, a few weeks later for $14 billion. WorldCom then acquired MCI for $37 billion, thus inheriting the remains of TimeNet. So TimeNet and MFS and the TimeNet people who left TimeNet to go to MFS all are back together, one big happy family. Click to Next. WorldCom attempted to acquire Sprint in 2002, failed and collapsed, and Verizon then bought the remains of MCI at a bargain price. Click to Next. Verizon acquires MCI in 2005 for $8.44 billion. Slide 38, The Road to the Internet, Part 1. The sequence of events that carried us from Boogie Woogie to Facebook begins with the Cold War and the research efforts spawned in response to the nuclear threat. The Valley Committee and the confluence of the computer and networking research that followed propelled us forward spending uncounted billions of dollars in pursuit of advanced technology. There is no doubt that some of this was overreaction and there was much waste, but that Cold War era spending fostered useful spin-offs in the form of domestic applications for powerful time sharing and networking. ARPANET and the research dollars had a profound influence on everything that followed. The part that hasn't been told is the carry-through of ARPA research into the civilian world that brought forth profound changes to business and society. These changes would not have happened or might have happened very differently without the efforts of some very innovative entrepreneurs. 
ARPANET, with its close-held access and highly restrictive acceptable uses policies, played little role in the day-to-day -day life of those outside of the military and academia. Ordinary businesses and their customers, whose tax dollars were being used to fund these efforts, received little benefit and were scarcely aware of its existence. Slide 39. When Timeshare rolled out a relatively inexpensive timesharing service on relatively inexpensive computers built for that market, many businesses began to appreciate the value and the concept we would later call software as a service began to emerge. When TimeNet began offering worldwide networking services, the business community welcomed these new capabilities. Despite the relatively low cost, these services were still fairly expensive, but they were widely available to businesses and changed how the world saw computing and communications. The AT&T breakup in 1984, the rise of microcomputers throughout the 1980s, and finally the emergence of the commercial internet in 1992 broke down the cost barriers and made computers and networking available to everyone. The assault by Rick Adams and his merry band of rebels on the ANS Empire, their end run around the establishment, first with the kicks and then via May East, blunted attempts by the old empire to retain control over the internet. May East busted the internet loose from the restrictive acceptable usage policies of the NSF and the telephony-style settlement charges that had been assumed by the big carriers who were going to control the Internet. This freed the Internet to become the wide-open, Wild West, anything-goes environment we know today. The commercially built MFS data backbone took precedence over the taxpayer-funded NSF backbone and rendered ANS's ambitions moot. Thanks to the battles these people fought, no one single entity owns or controls the internet today. Slide 40. In 1992, recognizing that the traditional value-added networking model was not suited to the demands of a world that had fully embraced TCP, IP, and Ethernet, a group of people left TimeNet to create MFS DataNet. DataNet then created May East in conjunction with Rick Adams and UUNet, replaced the kicks, and soon May East was carrying over 90% of the entire world's internet traffic. MFS then negotiated a deal whereby the MFS National ATM backbone could carry the traffic of the emerging Internet. This rendered the taxpayer-funded ANS backbone virtually irrelevant, especially since ANS still insisted on controlling commercial usage of their backbone. The Internet grew rapidly until MFS and UUNet agreed to join forces. MFS acquired UUNet in 1996, setting off a chain of dominoes that engulfed the industry. WorldCom bought MFS weeks after the UUNet acquisition, then bought MCI, only to collapse while trying to buy Sprint. Meanwhile, the RBOX had been trying to reassemble the remains of Ma Bell and put Humpty Dumpty back together again. As they're doing so, AT&T itself collapsed in bankruptcy and was acquired by SBC. A highly relevant tangent, which I addressed in my previous book, Securing the Network, is the role of Enron in the emergence of streaming media and video on demand. That is a story that deserves its own presentation. History has not treated Enron kindly, perhaps for good reasons, but Enron's broadband communications company, EBS, was not involved in the corporate machinations and financial misdealings that led to Enron's downfall. There were many good people who worked at EBS, and they deserve to be remembered for their innovations and especially for the creation of advanced media distribution platforms. Demonstrated, sold, and up and running by the end of 2000, they built the powerful streaming services that Netflix, Hulu, and a long list of others use today. Another important factor is the involvement of the entrenched, monopoly-minded corporations that have risen to control internet access. In the 1990s, we had the unbundling of local telephone loops, and for a time, competition to the local exchange carriers arose. These companies were called Competitive Local Exchange Carriers, or CLECs, and offered connectivity in direct competition to SBC and the other baby bells, as well as the big cable companies. These monopoly-minded companies did not take kindly to the upstarts intruding on what they considered rightfully their domain, and fought back, eventually killing the CLECs. With the collapse of the CLECs in the early 2000s, 
the remains of Ma Bell and the big cable operators swooped in and captured what is effectively today a monopoly on subscriber access and have fought furiously to block any competition. In much of the U.S. today, if you live in an area served by AT&T, then AT&T may in fact be the only ISP you can get. If you live in an area controlled by Comcast, then Comcast may be the only service you can get. Charter Spectrum and a few others have their areas too. Some areas are served by both a telephone giant and a cable giant, and you can freely choose between these two, which is really no choice at all. Very few places have an independent third alternative to the telco and cable companies, and where a serious competitor has tried to enter, such as Google Fiber, the monopoly-minded ISPs have fought tooth and nail to block them. Network neutrality is a hot topic today, but if we had genuine choice in access providers, network neutrality would become a minor issue as competition would enforce fair play. We need to lower barriers to entry for access providers and to foster competition in the access space.